Braces are awesome, but there are some risks when you're undergoing orthodontic treatment. And in today's incredibly long video, we're gonna go through each and every one of the most commonly consented for things in orthodontic treatment that may occur throughout your treatment, so you should be aware. Let's go. What's up guys, Dr. Eric here back with an incredibly overdue video of Races Explained. I hope you guys have all been doing awesome. I've been super busy planning, you know, the next chapter and things like that. And I will be announcing that on Instagram. So if you don't follow me yet there, make sure to check it out at Dr. Greg Ortho. I'll be posting about it probably in the next couple of weeks here about what's next. It's not that I'm stopping what I'm doing professionally, but I'm adding something new that might be of interest to you guys. Also, I've hit a little bit of a creative lull. I've been trying to come up with these videos for you guys. So if there's anything that you guys want more of, because this is literally for you guys, Go ahead, let me know in the comments. I wanna do a little bit more of explanation videos on like TikTok and Instagram. So if you see like a reel or a short or anything like that, that you'd like me to explain, go ahead and tag me. It's Dr. Greg Ortho on Instagram and on TikTok and you know where I am here. Okay, so today's episode, we're gonna dive right into it. It's kind of a longer episode, but it's something that you should know about before and maybe even early on in your braces journey. You can jump to whatever part you want, but it is something that if you're considering getting started with orthodontic treatment, I would recommend you watch it all the way through so you're aware of all the possible things that could go wrong. Likely none of them will go wrong, but you should be aware of them just in case. This is about informed consent. What that is is basically that you're consenting that your orthodontist is gonna treat you, but you're informed about all the possible risks that can come with orthodontics. Now, there's a bunch of pros, and there's definitely more often than not that the pros outweigh the cons, but you should be aware that there are some things to be aware of before starting orthodontic treatment. Now, what we're gonna run through today is the American Association of Orthodontists Informed Consent, and I'm sure you've heard some variant of this, if not this exact same thing, when you first start your orthodontic treatment. There's 21 bullet points that they hit, and we're gonna drive through them, but we're gonna go through them pretty quickly because there's a lot of videos on our channel where we've basically expanded on each and every one of these. And I'll try to link out as many of them as I can in the description of today's video if you wanna learn more about them. I'll also link out this document. It's like a two, three page document, and that will also be accessible for you guys if you wanna follow along or read it in more depth on there. The first thing I wanna talk about is something that we talk about quite a bit on the channel, and that is the result of your treatment. And this really comes down to proper communication between you and your orthodontist. I'm gonna read it verbatim and then we're gonna talk about it for a second here. Orthodontic treatment usually proceeds as planned and we intend to do everything possible to achieve the best result for every patient. However, we cannot guarantee that you'll be completely satisfied with your results, nor can all complications or consequences be anticipated. The success of orthodontic treatment depends on your cooperation in keeping appointments, maintaining good hygiene, avoiding loose or broken appliances, and following the orthodontist instructions carefully. On top of that, it really comes down to properly communicating what your goals are for your orthodontist and vice versa. So if you're coming in because you're concerned about your protrusion of your teeth, but they think that you're coming in because of the crowding of the teeth, well then now you're going for treatment for two different goals. So it's proper communication and that starts at day one. I always say proper communication between you and your orthodontist is critical. So you have to make sure that they're aware of what your concern is and they'll more often than not assure you that they're addressing those goals. Every orthodontist is gonna to treat towards the standard that they think is ideal, but maybe your ideal is different than what they're going for. So like I said, really important to have good communication and this starts on day one. All right, let's move on to bullet point number two and that is the length of treatment. The length of treatment depends on a number of issues including the severity of the problem, the patient's growth, the level of cooperation, an actual treatment time is usually close to an estimated treatment time, but treatment can be lengthened, for example, if there's unanticipated growth, if there's a habit that's affecting the structures, if the periodontal or dental problems occur, or if cooperation is not adequate. There are a few other factors that are not listed on here, and that has to do with bone density, has to do with age, has to do with complexity of the case, hygiene, all those things go in with these factors to determine the average treatment length. Now, when you come in for treatment, we try to give you the best estimate possible about how long it's gonna be, but sometimes, if you're lucky, it'll go quicker than that. And sometimes, if you're not lucky or you're not cooperating or something, it might go longer than that. And certain times, if there's an unforeseen thing that comes up in treatment, like let's say a tooth is ankylosed, which we'll talk about in a minute, well, there might be some modifications to your treatment plan, which may modify the length of your treatment. So something to be aware of. Moving on to number three, and that is discomfort. The mouth is very sensitive, so you can expect an adjustment period and some discomfort due to the introduction of orthodontic appliances. Non-prescription pain medication can be used during the adjustment period. And we've talked about other ways where you can ease the pain or discomfort from your braces. So we talked about Tylenol, which is the non-prescription medication that they're talking about. Wax, if it's irritating your lips, the gels. We have a whole video on that. I'm not gonna dive into it but it's something to be aware of that when you go in for orthodontics, 
you might experience some discomfort and that's completely normal. Moving on to number four, and that is relapse. Completed orthodontic treatment does not guarantee perfectly straight teeth for the rest of your life. Retainers will be required to keep your teeth in the new positions as a result of your orthodontic treatment. So retainer wear, every orthodontist does a little bit differently, but more often than not, we recommend indefinite retention at night times at least, which means that you're gonna be wearing your retainers for as long as you want your teeth to stay straight, at least at nights. But in the beginning, you are gonna to have to wear full time depending on your orthodontics prescription. I always say it's like kind of like on the highway when they have those little bumps on the side of the road to make sure that you don't you know, steer off the side of the road. That's kind of what retainers do. Throughout the day, there might be some relapse, you know, a little bit of movements, but the retainers at night kind of will re-guide it back into the lane. So like, let's say you start drifting off to the side of the lane, you feel that like, well, the retainers will basically re-guide you back to where ideal is. And if you do that every night, then your teeth won't shift that far away from ideal. And this will help, you know, steer it in and make sure everything stays straight for as long as possible. Moving on to number five, and that has to do with extractions. Some cases will require the removal of deciduous, which are baby teeth, or permanent teeth. There's additional risks associated with extractions that your dentist will talk about. More often than not, these are pretty minor, but they are things that your dentist will consent you for when you have the extractions. But orthodontics, in some cases, does require extractions, and we've talked about the reasons why, you know, for protrusions, for proclination, for crowding, for masking skeletal disharmonies, a bunch of different reasons. And you know that your orthodontist doesn't just extract teeth for fun, it's if your case needs it. And they'll review those options with you when you go for your consultation or throughout your treatment. Moving on to number six, and that is orthognathic surgery, AKA jaw surgery. Some patients have a significant skeletal disharmonies which require orthodontic treatment in conjunction with orthognathic, which is dental facial surgery. Just like with extractions, but a little bit more severe, there are additional risks associated with surgery, which you should discuss with your oral surgeon or maxillofacial surgeon prior to beginning orthodontic treatment because you don't want to start treatment and then realize that you don't want to do the surgery. It doesn't make much sense, right? And it even says here, patients discontinuing orthodontic treatment without completing the planned surgical treatment may have a malocclusion, which is the bite that's wrong, that's worse than when you began treatment. So it's really important to make sure that you're aware of everything before you really dive in. Moving along to number, I think seven, decalcification and dental caries. We talk about this a ton and you know I'm a big, big advocate for proper oral hygiene. So excellent oral hygiene is essential during orthodontic treatment as are regular visits to your family dentist. Inadequate or improper hygiene can result in cavities, discolored teeth, periodontal disease, and decalcification, which are those permanent scars on the teeth. Now, these same problems can occur even if you're not in braces, but there's a much higher risk when you're in braces because there's just a lot more stuff in your mouth. So please check out the videos on this channel to know how to have proper oral hygiene throughout your braces journey. Moving along to number eight, and that is root resorption. Now, this is something that we really don't know why it happens. It's hard to predict when it happens, and the only way we're gonna know if it does occur is with regular x-rays throughout your treatment. Now, a lot of people naturally just have short teeth. Teeth, <laughs> that's okay, and a lot of people go through life completely fine with that. But if we notice this throughout your orthodontic treatment, your orthodontist might recommend a pause of the movement or just the removal of the orthodontic appliances because we don't want to make a problem worse. Teeth are attached to the jaw bones through these roots, right? And you don't see them. It's basically the part of the tooth that you see is like the tip of the iceberg. But let's say you have like periodontal bone loss, then basically losing support from the tooth side that you see downward. Now, if you have root resorption, the root is getting shorter from the other end. So you really want to maintain good hygiene and avoid root resorption because it's like burning a candle from both ends. Okay, moving on to number nine, and this has to do with nerve damage. This is something that's really rare, but it's something to be aware of as a possibility of orthodontics. This is more common in cases where you've had previous trauma to the tooth or like a deep cavity or something along those lines where it gets closer to the nerve. But there's this thing called spontaneous pulpal necrosis, and that's basically death of the tooth for like no apparent reason. Now, orthodontics can aggravate nerve inflammation because we're basically moving the tooth throughout the bone, right? Now, this isn't something that's common, but it is a risk factor of orthodontics. And it's something to be aware of when you're diving into treatment that if you've had, let's say, trauma to the teeth or something like that, well, that can be aggravated with orthodontics. We just will monitor that more regularly with the x-rays, looking for root resorption and pulpal you know, necrosis throughout your treatment. If we notice anything, of course, we'll refer you over to your general dentist and they can come up with a plan on how we can best treat it for you. All right, moving on to the next one, and that is periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is basically gingivitis that's gone bad. You know, I mean, gingivitis is bad as it is. It's inflammation of the gums. But if it progresses to what's called periodontitis, then you start having loss of bony support of the teeth. 
and the bone will start to go downward, basically making your tooth have less support. Periodontal disease can occur with or without braces. The biggest culprit of periodontal disease progression is bad hygiene, right? With the braces, it's harder to maintain hygiene, so you wanna be very, very diligent and make sure you go to your regular cleanings throughout treatment. Now, if your hygiene is not very good, your dentist might recommend a quicker recall interval. So let's say you were going every six months, well, now they might want to see you every three months or four months or something like that. But this is something that can be worsened with orthodontic treatment, especially if you're not maintaining good hygiene. Or if you're doing a treatment plan that might go against what your orthodontist is recommending. For instance, if your orthodontist recommends in a severely crowded case to extract some teeth and you say absolutely not, well, then we're trying to fit the teeth within a jawbone that might not accommodate it. And if you push the teeth kind of out of the jawbone, you have an increased risk of periodontal effects, which is basically losing support of the teeth. And this goes back to that first bullet point of having a good conversation with your orthodontist to make sure you guys are on the same page with the goals. Moving on to the next bullet point, and that is injury from the actual orthodontic appliances. I'm gonna read this one and we're gonna talk through it. Activities or foods which could damage, loosen, or dislodge orthodontic appliances need to be avoided. So these, we've talked about this, foods to avoid with braces. Loosened or damaged orthodontic appliances can be inhaled or swallowed and could cause other damage to the patient. You should inform your orthodontist of any unusual symptoms such as loose or broken appliances as soon as they're noticed. Also, you can have damage to existing restorations when you pop these brackets off when you're done with treatment. So let's say you pop a bracket off and the veneer was kind of loose. You might have to go to your dentist and have that veneer redone. And that's just the natural risk of bonding a bracket to a veneer that's bonded to the tooth. There's an area where it might fail and you might need a new restoration. Moving on to the next bullet point, this has to do with headgear. It's not as prevalent, but I remember I heard a story about this once and I think that that's the story that brought it into the informed consent. And it's basically saying headgear, the ones that are strapped around the back of your head, they can cause damage to the patient, including injury to the eyes or face. Remember I heard a story once where the headgears are attached to the head with like strong elastics, right? And they came out somehow and it poked the patient in the eye and they lost their eye. So this isn't something that's very common anymore, but it is something that they included in the informed consent just in case you might need a headgear. I can't even remember the last time I delivered a headgear. So that tells you how common these are. Moving on to number 13, and that has to do with the temporal mandibular joint, so the TMJ. Problems may occur to the jaw joints, including TMJ pain, headaches, ear pain. Many factors can affect the health of the joints, okay? These include things like past traumas, blood to the face, arthritis, hereditary tendencies, and these problems might occur with or without orthodontic treatment. It's kind of independent. Any jaw joint symptoms, including jaw pain, popping, or difficulty opening or closing, these should be reported immediately to your orthodontist and they can come up with a plan to help treat it for you. You might have to also bring in a specialist to help on board if it is something that's a little bit too complicated for the orthodontist and that would be a referral to a TMJ specialist or something like that. Moving on, we talked about this a little bit earlier and this has to do with impacted or ankylosed teeth. So there are two different things. An impacted tooth is a tooth that's stuck in the gums for no reason and there's we have to do something to help bring it into the mouth. And ankylosis means that the tooth is actually fused to the bone, which means that it's not able to be moved. Now, both of these are gonna require some help from a specialist, like an oral surgeon. If it's an impacted tooth, what we might have to have you go do is go see the oral surgeon where they're gonna expose that tooth and put a little chain on it, and we'll fish that tooth into the mouth. Now, most times that works just fine, but sometimes those teeth can be what's called ankylose, which means that they're fused to the bone. So instead of that tooth actually coming into the mouth, everything else starts to lean into that area. And if that's the case, sometimes we have to extract that ankylose tooth and have an implant placed in that area. Moving right along, next we're gonna talk about occlusal adjustments. And, and what this means is adjusting the chewing surface of your teeth to just equilibrate everything and make it all balance out. You can expect minimal imperfections in the way your teeth meet following treatment, just immediately following treatment. An occlusal equilibration may be necessary, which is the grinding method used to fine tune the occlusion. And it may be necessary to remove a small amount of enamel between the teeth. That's completely normal and something that you might need at the end of your treatment if your orthodontist recommends it. But a lot of the times you're gonna have some normal settling of the teeth after the braces come off. And that is basically will help get that bite in a perfect balanced area. This next one is a little bit late in the sequence. I feel like this should have been like number two, but it's basically talking about a not ideal result. So due to a wide variety, you know, in the size, shape of teeth, missing teeth, the achievement of an ideal result in your mind might not be fully achieved. So like a complete closure of a specific tooth or a space, something like if the teeth are too small, what we might end up having you do is see a dentist after your treatment to have like a bonding done to make a tooth the right size because you might have a discrepancy between your upper and lower teeth. And yes, sometimes we can do IPR on the lower teeth to make those smaller instead of having to build up, let's say an upper tooth. But in certain cases that might not be possible. So 
Again, this is something to talk about with your orthodontist because you want to make sure that you're going into the treatment and your expectations are reasonable and achievable, right? So that's why I think this should have been earlier on, but that's fine. I didn't write this. I'm just explaining it. All right, we have six more left. You're doing awesome. But next, we're going to talk about third molars or wisdom teeth. Now, wisdom teeth are something that your orthodontist keep an eye on throughout treatment. And if they are impacted or erupting in an unfavorable way or something like that, they might recommend removal immediately before the braces are put on, during the time your braces are on, or after. I'm not quite sure why this is in the informed consent. I feel like this is something that would just explain to you throughout treatment. But if your orthodontist does recommend the extraction of your third molars or your wisdom I would get those done whenever they recommend it. That way you can have the best long-term prognosis for all your teeth. This is one that oftentimes goes completely unmentioned, but it's really important. And this has to do with allergies. You might not know that you have an allergy to maybe something like latex or nickel or something like that, but that might develop, you know, in the beginning of treatment or throughout treatment. And that's okay, but you have to be aware that these are the appliances that we use. So if you develop an allergy to something that we use in orthodontics, we either might have to adjust your treatment length or adjust the appliances that we use to achieve that goal for your treatment. All right, four more left. And this next one is something that was recently brought about and that's because of COVID. And this has to do with the transmission of disease in the dental office. Now, mind you, we try to keep these offices super clean, as, as clean as we can, right? But naturally, just the fact that we can't necessarily socially distance all of our patients that much, depending on the office, there's an inherent risk that you might get a transmissible like a respiratory disease. In most of my offices, our patients have their mask on until we're working on them directly. But there is a risk. Like I said, this isn't an, a hot place. Actually, I remember during COVID time, they did a study and the dental offices were one of the safest places to go because we're so careful about transmission of diseases. But it is an inherent risk whenever you're going indoors and something to be aware of. And on that, we're going to move to the next point, And that is general health. So what this means is that your general health might impact your orthodontic treatment. For instance, if you have problems such as bone, blood, endocrine disorders, or if you're taking prescription medications, this can either speed up or slow down orthodontic tooth movement. Drugs like bisphosphonates can slow down tooth movement. So it's really important to make sure you give a good health history to your orthodontist so that we can give you the best estimate for your treatment length and feasibility of achieving your goal. So very important to mention that at the initial consultation. And now the penultimate one or the, the one from the last one, and this has to do with the use of tobacco products. Now, tobacco products are awful for your general health. So if something that, so if this is something that you're struggling with, and I hope this video helps to tell you just to stop and try and come up with methods to discontinue tobacco use. But the use of tobacco, whether it's chewing tobacco or smoking tobacco, can negatively impact your health as well as your orthodontic result. Tobacco has been shown to progress things like periodontal disease, and basically affect the healing process with oral surgery, but it also has been shown to slow down orthodontic tooth movement. If so if you are someone that is a tobacco user, you may have to accept either a longer treatment or and or a compromised orthodontic result. And the last informed consent topic we're gonna talk about today has to do with TADS or temporary anchorage devices, mini implants. They're all basically different ways of saying the same thing. And we have a video which talks about TADS, but those are mini screws that your orthodontist might place within the jaws to facilitate orthodontic tooth movement. And there's a lot of things that we consent for when we do this. Things like these screws may become loose and that might require the removal or and or placement of a new screw. It's possible that the tissue around these become inflamed or infected and this could grow over the device which would also require it surgically be removed and potentially placed nearby or in another site. Also about these screws can break in the mouth. That actually happened to me. I had six mini implants in my mouth throughout my treatment and one of them on my palate actually broke and they were able to like surgically fish it out luckily, but it might have to be referred to an oral surgeon to help us remove it if it does fracture. And there's a risk that when these are placed, they could perforate the sinus and there's some effects with that as well. So a lot of things to be aware of if you're getting temporary anchorage devices. In some cases though, it's really, really critical to get an ideal result. What I really wanna drive home in this incredibly long video was basically all the things that could potentially come up with your orthodontic treatment. Now, there are some special occasions where there might be more and there's a different form that your orthodontist can talk to you about that, but these are the general things that I usually try to warn my patients about in the beginning of their treatment so that they're as aware as possible about what to expect at our treatment. Do any of these happen in most patients? Not really but it's something to be aware of because you might be that patient that it does happen in. And I want you to be aware of what the problems that could arise with orthodontics is. If you guys enjoyed today's video or have any comments, concerns, let me know down in the comments. Make sure you like, thumbs up, subscribe. I already forgot what to say at this point because I, it's been so long since I made a video. I miss you guys. If you think of anything more that you want to hear about from me, let me know down below. If not, I'll catch you guys next time on another episode of Braces Explained. But for now, Dr. Greg out.